I'm Dr. Steve Nissen, and I'm here with Dr. Wilson Tang, who is a relatively unique member of our heart failure section. Now, Dr. Tang is both an accomplished clinician and an accomplished basic scientist. We're going to talk about cardiomyopathy, and uh, before we get there, I mean, let's just go to the basics for a moment. Your definition of cardiomyopathy for our purposes of discussion. Well, it's very easy because cardio means heart. Myopathy means muscle weakness. Yeah. So it's really when the heart muscle becomes weak. Due to something other than coronary disease. Yeah, well, I mean, coronary disease originally was classified as ischemic cardiomyopathy, actually. Yeah, yeah. But I think the whole idea was that there's a primary cardiomyopathy, which is a fundamental defect of the heart muscle. Yeah. And then there is the secondary, which is from all the different insults of the body that actually causes the heart to be weak. So let's talk about some of the different forms of cardiomyopathy and what the state of the art is now in understanding them and treating them. And so, so what are some of the more common forms that you deal so with? So there are basically four separate types. You know, obviously there is the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is when the heart muscle gets sick. Uh, with unexplained reasons, and many forms of that will be genetic, meaning it runs along the family. Uh, there's obviously the more common other side of it, which is called dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, dilated cardiomyopathy is what our kind of bread and butter, uh, kind of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, when the heart basically looks dilated and weak. Uh, then there are much more rare diseases. One is called restrictive cardiopathy. The, the heart is actually very stiff. It cannot really relax and stretch to recoil. Yeah. And the fourth type is actually a very unique and rare form called arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And that's when, particularly when the right side is weak or yeah. when there's any channelopathies. Yeah. Now, uh, with dilated cardiomyopathy, um, they run in families. Yes. So what yes. have you learned about this? You, you know, one of your areas of expertise is genetics. Yes. So yes. maybe you could talk about the genetics of cardiomyopathy. So it's been actually very intriguing. Uh, for the last five or 10 years, we have actually made significant advances due to the technological advances. In fact, the amount of genes that we identified almost doubled. So now we could actually estimate about uh, 30 to even up to 50% of patients do have some genetic abnormalities. We used to call this idiopathic. Yes, we call it idiopathic. In fact, we are so comfortable telling people that a virus attacked your heart uh, that uh, we kind of stop all the workup. And didn't fact, look any further. No, we didn't look any further, particularly when asking their family members, anybody with sun cardiac death or with you know heart failure when they were young. And guess what? I have a whole lineage of people that have had this. Exactly. Yeah. And and embarrassingly, sometimes you know we ourselves would miss them because Many times it takes multiple times to ask their family members, and they discover over time. In fact, I have a patient who have a genetic uh, you know, variant. Every time he brings uh, the family tree and will give me three or four different new pa people that they identify having problems. So should everybody with a dilated cardiomyopathy have a genetic profile? Yeah. This is a very, very timely question. In fact, the NIH is sponsoring a study specifically asking about that question. It is a 30-center study across the nation. We are one of them. We are one of the top enrollers in this study called DCM Precision Health Study or Precision Medicine Study. And the question is how often do we identify unrecognized uh, genetic abnormality. And it's really coming up to about one in five. So let me play devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. So why do it? So what do you learn from the genetic profile that might actually benefit the patient? I understand that it's intellectually satisfying yes. to have a cause, yes. but why? how is it actionable? There are actually three reasons why we do that. The first reason is different types of abnormalities that we identify from the genetic profile could actually uh, identify potential natural history that may be different. Some genetic abnormalities are much more severe and yeah, rapidly yeah. progress yes. yeah. over time. And in fact, we have patients where, you know, within a short period of time that we identify that they have these abnormalities, they uh, rapidly progress. So do you triage them then to earlier transplant? Yes, in fact, we actually, watch them very carefully. These are the individuals that really need centers of excellence. 
uh, really experienced individuals, and not just uh, one or two doctors, teams of doctors, uh, uh, EP doctors, you know, imaging doctors to characterize and trying to follow them and actually prepare the next step should they get worse. And the second reason, and this more important reason, is about the families. Because once you identify the actual pathologic variant, you ended up being able to identify their relatives who is at risk. And for that, even when you don't have any manifestation of symptoms, you can potentially start watching them very carefully. In fact, this is one of the things that we do very often to provide clinical screening for those at-risk patients and also follow them over time. And sometimes we uncover things that they don't understand. For example, there are times when we clarify the uncertainty of their diagnosis. They were told they have this problem. It turns out it was something else. And we see that quite often. And the third thing really comes down to is there are many new drugs that are currently in late stage development, some even already approved by the FDA, the transdiastin amyloidosis yeah. with the hereditary. And I want to get to PR, that, yes, next. Yeah, yeah. As well as the dystrophin, the, the, the dystrophy mutation for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Yes. That's also an FDA approved exon skipping drug. Yeah. There are at least three or four different types of drugs right now that are in late stage clinical development that are specifically targeting these mutations. Yeah, I want to turn for a moment to something that I think is really interesting, which yes. of course is amyloid heart disease, yes. which is a, a form of cardiomyopathy. Restrictive. Uh, rest yeah, restrictive cardiomyopathy. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm old enough to remember when these were patients that we watched die relatively quickly. Yes. Everything we tried seemed to backfire. Yes. It was a horrible thing to go through. Yes. There's been some progress. Maybe you yes, could bring us there, up to speed. There has been. In fact, I, I still remember about 12 years ago, uh, we put a patient through a transplant committee, and that was when everybody still thinks this is a death sentence. We couldn't even not even transplant these patients. Today, we do that almost routinely. We have many drugs for two major types of amyloidosis. The AL amyloidosis, that's really a blood type. You know, the blood actually makes the abnormal protein that deposit in the heart that stains positive on amyloid. And then a liver type, uh, which is called transthyrethrin or prealbumin. Uh, there are also different forms. One runs in family with a genetic uh, abnormality that you can identify. This is the, 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 uh, the uh, transthyrethrin, yes, TTR, yes, amyloid. TTR amyloid. Yeah. Particularly in African Americans, up to 3% of patients. We always thought that African American patients uh, with sick hearts, could, must be their diabetes or must be their, their kidney problem or hypertension. It turns out many of them actually runs in families uh, with this genetic abnormality. And the second thing is the, there's this so-called senile amyloidosis. Uh, we started to see more and more of that. In fact, we have observed different patterns in imaging. Our colleagues here at the Cleveland Clinic recognize some of these in echocardiogram as also in nuclear scan imaging. And we now can actually identify them non-invasively. And then uh, new drugs have actually been approved by the FDA. Uh, we know that very well. So for AL amyloid, how, how are they being for treated? For AL amyloid is still you know, some form of chemotherapy. We're trying to actually reduce the, the, the burden of the, the cells that are making these uh, proteins. Uh, for the um, uh, transthyrethrin amyloid, there are drugs to stabilize that thought molecule that actually allows them to circulate without depositing now, in the, in the, the heart. this drug tefamidus that yes. we've heard a lot about, is that now clinically, is that now available? It is FDA approved. Yeah. Uh, uh, just last month, I think. Yeah, I think it's and it's uh, and, and I think, yeah, we are all very excited about it because, I mean, just like our oncology colleagues, we now start to have really targeted therapy that directly targeting to the biology. So we, does so does tefamidus, this drug for TTR amyloid, mm -hmm. at what stage of the disease does it work? Mm -hmm. Can, are there people that are too late to be treated? Are there people that are early that should be treated? Tell us a little bit about patient of selection. Course the, uh, of course, the study is still, you know, the, the pivotal study, which includes all of it. Uh, I think uh, it certainly works very well in those that are less sick. There is a subgroup analysis that show that, yeah, the, the, the class three patients seem to be not benefiting as well, yeah. although overall their mortality seemed to be good. Yeah. So, of course, you know more about subgroup analysis than, than most people. Yeah. What we do know is that overall, a lot, of it, a lot of the management 
It's also uh, basic heart failure management, fluid retention, yeah. trying to kind of modulate the But drugs. it's pretty tough. But, and, but yeah, it's very tough, and that's why you know we have dedicated center at the Cleveland Clinic that actually try to manage these patients to get them to the best of the, of the availabilities, and then actually start these medicines. And uh, the clinical trial show compared to a uh, sugar pill, this actually uh, so, reduced uh, adverse events. So if they're very late stage, mm -hmm. um, are you guys willing to transplant them and then give them a drug like Defamidus? Yeah, well, some, some selected patients, when they have only the organ that are specifically affected only by the, to yeah. the heart but not other organs, we do consider for transplant. There are selected centers in the country do that. And particularly with, uh, uh, with uh, TTR, Cena amyloid, uh, we uh, have had very good results of our transplant program. Yeah. I mentioned my first patient was like 12 years. He's still around. He's still actually uh, running on a treadmill and doing well. I think almost 10, 11 years out now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so is there anything new we need to know about, we should talk about with genetics and other things with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Yeah. This is a special concern. Yeah, I think hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has actually also evolved, and uh, there is a, a profound understanding now that... Uh, the way the heart actually becomes thick is because it was using excessive energy and cannot relax. And this is actually very interesting because the entire science comes by studying tarantula in South America. Mm -hmm. And so what they figure out is that they are overburning, almost like the heart is always in overdrive. Yeah. And so by being thick, it becomes really inefficient. So People have actually used small molecules, identified small molecules, to kind of dampen that overdriving right at the abnormality. Are you, are you talking about Mavicamptin? Yes, Mavicamptin. So that drug specifically binds to the myosin head, and the myosin head becomes less you know, overaggressive, yeah. and it actually reduces the stress. And so it is actually a potential benefit drug even for patients before they develop yeah. Thickness. Now we should caution everybody, this drug is not clinically available, it's, but it's in trials. It's and, in uh, late stage trial, and uh, the phase two studies did show in obstructive patients, they improve their functional capacity and reduce the obstruction. Well, there's lots to talk about. Yes. We covered only some of it, yes. but uh, thank you so much for uh, bringing everybody up to speed on the latest in, in uh, management of cardiomyopathies. Thank you for watching.